So we're so early still. We're still in the like early, early, early adoption phase of this technology. No more than two to three percent of the world. We have done card shows, and the people come up to us like they think we're the CEO of Bitcoin. We are light years from where we're going to be in the future. Are you scared to say the things ever that you're about to say or that you just said? The North Korean government issued a statement from its Ministry of Defense saying they were going to bomb us. What What was your you know, one minute version of uh, of getting to Bitcoin? I also would be a little careful about like putting all your eggs in like the Trump basket or whatever. Like I get it, he's saying some nice things, but it was pretty obvious to anybody listening to that speech, he had no freaking idea what he was saying. And which looks very important to help people who live under tyranny. And there's billions of people, 5.7 billion people by our latest count who don't have any sort of representative government really. They're out there saying, oh, it's gonna be great for the dollar. <laughs> it's not, it's gonna be great for America and Americans, it's gonna be great for. It's not gonna be good for the dollar and the dollar industrial complex. It's gonna kill the dollar industrial complex. Mr. Alex Gladstein, thank you so much for being a playable character in a sea of non-playable characters. Thank you for joining me here today, sir. Appreciate you having me, thanks. Yeah, so for those who don't know, Alex is the Chief Strategy Officer of the Human Rights Foundation, the Oslo Freedom Forum, the author of two incredible books, some of my favorites, Check Your Financial Privilege and Hidden Repression, How the IMF and the World Bank Sell Exploitation as Development and Freedom Fighter Inside of Bitcoin Trading Cards, those are <laughs> beautiful cards that Alex is uh, uh, adorning. And, um, and then again, most importantly here, a true playable character. So in saying all this, you just had a you know, phenomenal talk. I loved your talks in Nashville. Um, Thank you. you yeah, you, you, say, you say a lot of things that are, um, boy, I, I want to say risque, but they're not risque. They're just very, they're shocking at times, right? And I, I want to start with this. Are you, are you scared to say the things ever that you're about to say or that you just said? Uh, <laughs> um, no, uh, b- because I, I, I sort of, had worse uh, threats um, previously to getting into the Bitcoin stuff really deeply. I, I worked on a lot of different projects at the Human Rights Foundation. And one of the ones we worked on was uh, related to helping people in North Korea get access to the internet. They're just totally cut off and nobody's interested in helping them. Obviously, their government is a horrible dictatorship, but the Chinese and the Korean, South Koreans and the Americans, like no one wants to like do anything. They just want to like keep it, keep them trapped. Um, so there's really no initiatives at scale to help. So we, we got involved and um, for a long time now, more than a decade, we've been helping get get outside information into North Korea. And one of the ways we, we sort of did it was through balloons. So you'd go to like the DMZ and you'd wait till the winds are blowing north and you would uh, attach like a payload uh, in a garbage bag of USB keys, uh, dollar bills, little leaflets, food, things like that. And you would attach it to this big balloon in, at night and you would just let it go. And it goes over the DMZ into North Korea. And then it uh, has a little bit of like an acid timer vial thing. And it just, the bag opens and it dumps everywhere. So we were doing this and uh, we had announced that we were doing it, which, you know, I'm not sure if that was the best idea, but uh, the North Korean government, issued a statement from its Ministry of Defense saying they were going to bomb us if we did it. Um, so that was pretty interesting. We were definitely, I, I, we, we knew they were bluffing kind of, but you never know, man. I mean, they're North Koreans. So, 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 be, so, so given like direct threats like that, um, you know, I, I think there, yeah, there's this, there's a vague sense of unease, of course, when you're disrupting, um, the global financial system. But, you know, there's just the thing is there's so many people working for Bitcoin, right? Like we're all working for Bitcoin, right? That's who we work for. So it's like, who are you going to go after? Like, what are you going to take certain people that it doesn't matter? We'll be like, a you know, a hydra, a multi-headed hydra coming right back at you. So, you know, if anything, the like really prominent core developers, you know, they they faced these threats from, from Craig Wright and, and maybe from state actors and whoever, and you know that that sucked, but no, I, I, I'm I'm fi- more than anything just super fired up. And every day is a treasure and an opportunity to help people. And we'll just take it one day at a time, and we'll go as far as we can until they stop us. That's the idea. It, I mean, it's you know you you're humble and you you kind of downplay it to a degree. So I I know that's what thing something that people appreciate about you. 
but it, it really is. I asked Max uh, Kaiser this last week at the end of the conference, I sat down, did an interview with him, and I asked mm-hmm. him the same thing. Have you been, are there times that you've been afraid to say what you're about to say? And you're like, I know there's a lot of powerful men with weapons that might not like what I'm about to say. Have there been times where you just said, this has to be said regardless? Have there been times where you've been afraid to say what you were about to say? Yeah, a few times. I mean, if- and I, I think you're the only two people I've really asked that because, quite frankly, even in Bitcoin world, there's not a lot of people that say what are on their mind or, or say things that might get them in, in some heat, in some hot water. Um, what, what, do you, what is it that sets you apart? I mean, what is it your upbringing? Like, what makes you that way? Because again, I, I brought up, you know, you know, Christ laying down his life and picking up his cross. And that's what, you know, at least Christians are called to do. It, no, truth, sure. no matter what, right? So what, what a lot of people don't do it. Most people, a lot of Christians don't do it, right? And so what's, what's different in you? What makes you tick differently? Uh, to- Look, there's this technology that's so powerful and it can be used by anybody in the world. And so many people don't know that yet. So the opportunity to share this with them and get them upgraded in terms of their personal empowerment and their ability to live their life the way they want to live it is so inspiring. And it's like jet fuel for me. So I don't need any encouragement. I'm good to go. Like I'm, I'm, I eventually I'll probably run out of gas at some point, but, um, not, not, not anytime soon. I mean, we've been trucking. I mean, now for, we started these programs in 2017 and, uh, each year we're just doing more and more and more and more. So it, it, we do what we can. Incredible. Yeah. And, I'll, and we'll link to your talks again. They're phenomenal talks. So anyone who hasn't seen those, Thank you. I mean, you, yeah, there, there really are some, uh, you know, and it seems obvious. It's like the old, the old, uh, I think it was Jim Rohn or, uh, well, Bob Proctor. You know, what's easy to do is easy not to do. Like you lay out this it's incredible not easy. case. No, it's not easy. Yeah, but for that, sure. that took, yeah, but even just public speaking is really hard, was hard for me when I started doing it. Um, it's uh, just practice, man. Uh, I've had so many talks and, I, you know, the more you do something, you, you get better at it. So what's nice is that, that Bitcoin's coming later in my career. So I had a lot of opportunity to write and to communicate ideas and, and speak. Uh, you know, pre 2017, when I started getting to this, um, so I practice. So, you know, it, it, it's just such an exciting opportunity to get 45, 50 minutes up on a stage in front of 5,000 people and, uh, and drop all these knowledge bombs on them is, is really fun. So I just, uh, I, I'm just so fired up and thankful to the Bitcoin mag team for, <laughs> for, for permitting me to do that. Uh, like an hour before Trump went on, that was, well, I guess, I guess two hours before Trump went on, but, um, but whatever it was, it was, it was, I mean, it's just insane to have that kind of audience. Um, and it was really fun. So hard to do, but glad to do it. And I tried to make sure that every minute of the talk was, was kind of carefully considered. I really wanted to provide as many visuals for people as possible so they could take pictures and understand like that this is not useless. This thing's so useful. It's useful in all these different countries. It's useful for all these different people. It's useful for all these different reasons. No price. I wasn't talking about the price. I didn't mention the price at all. It was all about the utility it has. Obviously, yeah, part of the utility is that it's this thing that over time becomes more valuable, but that's not really why necessarily so many people use it. There are all these other reasons. And, um, I was happy to share those with folks. Yeah. Yeah. It was what it was commerce, freedom, and power, I believe. And power. Right? Three tenets. Yeah. Yes. And it was. It, yeah. Well, because savings, savings is number one, but everybody mm-hmm. knows that. I don't, you don't need me to get up there to talk about savings. Mm-hmm. But these other three, I think even a lot of Bitcoiners don't know. I think a lot of Bitcoiners no. understand that Bitcoin's a good investment or that it's cool money that people can't stop, but they don't necessarily understand maybe the implication it has for the world. Um, and especially the mining and power one is something that I don't quite think people get, like even Bitcoiners, maybe a lot of Bitcoiners might not understand that Bitcoin is an energy savings technology. And what does that actually mean for us is, is big. It's big. It's big. It's really remarkable. You do have a gift for, for breaking things down into simple terms. Because again, like you're. Your two books, you know, here. I mean, they are they are some of my favorite books, really. And because thank you, you know, you've, yeah, it. you're welcome. And you know you you know you've written a good book when 
it constantly keeps coming up, you know, and, and, you know, you might be different, right? It's hard to like, Hey, go read my book into a sense. Right. But when I find myself or I hear other people and they're constantly referring to, you know, financial privilege or the IMF and what's going on in the world and kind of the system we're in, that's when, you know, you've, you've written something um, special and that kind of is evergreen almost right. And it stands the test of time. So um, in, in saying that, you know, Nashville speaking, you've gone all over the world and you talk about mm-hmm. it a lot in Nashville during those speeches, which are, people have to go we'll link to them here people have to go watch them what Thank gives you. you the yeah you're welcome what gives you the most hope um or, or i guess sorry what region of the world yeah. is giving you the most hope right now ultimately bitcoin helps everybody but the world's very unequal right now and and especially when it comes to money a lot of people have access to better money the dollar a lot of people don't have access to the dollar their, their currency really sucks so i think in an urgency sense of perspective it's really exciting that this technology finally exists and is getting out there in the hands of people who are stuck behind dictatorship, conflict, war, sanctions, whatever. Um, you know, that these information about this technology is being translated into all these languages and it's circulating inside Iran, inside Gaza, inside Cuba. It's, you know, w- whether it be imperialists or communists or fascists or whoever's going after people that this thing is, is there to help is, is, is the most heartwarming thing about Bitcoin is that it's uh, out there every day fighting for people who nobody else cares about, like fighting for people who, you know, the UN or the Red Cross or the World Bank obviously are are not helping and and that nobody's really figured out a way to do this. And there's no international institution that has was set up to improve the monetary technology of people. In fact, the big the big institutions as I discuss in my work hurt people in this regard. They like force people into these shitty kind of fiat currencies that are debased and devalued. Um, so the fact that some, you know, person, we don't even know who they are, what were, who are, how many people they were, where they're from. They invented this magical thing that, that, that is out there helping people who no one else can help is that's just, just amazing. Do you, do you think that it's, um, this is kind of like a multifaceted question here, but do you think, do you think it's kind of like Halen's razor? Do you think it's uh, in all the work you've done, traveling all around the world, all the research, you know, writing books, everything, talking to people? Yeah. Is it just centralized organizations, kind of Spider Man memeing, and just kind of like everyone doing ridiculous things because organizations, global entities, have gotten so big, or is it a few people at the top? W- what have you kind of dialed it into over the years, or both? Um. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, look, there's my work with, with HRF. Um, and then there's all the other things I do. I try to help the human rights foundation and its mission, which I think is very important to help people who live under tyranny. And there's billions of people, 5.7 billion people by our latest count who don't have any sort of representative government really. And I understand that there's a lot of flaws with the American model. And I write about those, but we also have to have context and understand that Texas is not Tibet. It's very different to live in an imperfect country versus a military occupation. Like these are different things and we should try to really take a step back and just, just consider that. Um, So very proud to work for HRF and and everything we're doing, but separate to that, I'm always just Bitcoining, 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 you know, all the time. So all my spare time is, is, is sort of Bitcoin related, learning as much as I can, sharing that information, writing about it, creating content, um, doing what we can. I mean, obviously through HRF, I've been able to uh, take advantage of an opportunity to deploy Bitcoin grants to people around the world. That's super satisfying and really awesome to see. We've been doing Bitcoin grants for five years now. Um, and uh, that program's grown exponentially. And it's so awesome to see that. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how I would divvy it up. That. Do you do you think do you, do you get pushback? I mean, I get the human organizations, right? The human rights, no, you know, no yeah. pun intended, but sure. the human rights foundation is a human organization. And do you get um, and not to divulge too many details, but is there you know good dialogue, good you know pushback inside the, the organization? Yeah. You, know, you know, people disagreeing on things. You know, I hopefully in a way, I mean, healthy. You know, just dialogue. Like, what what does that look like? I guess in a day to day. So. Um... Yeah, we're not a Bitcoin organization. We're a human rights organization. And I've been able to help people understand that Bitcoin is a really important tool for human rights. So we have a burgeoning, growing Bitcoin program. It's called the Financial Freedom Program uh, at HRF. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think by and large, the human rights movement does not understand Bitcoin. Um, parts, bits and pieces of the movement are getting it, but we're very early. I mean, people, I think it's weird. It's like people are like, uh, you know, been listening, hearing about Bitcoin for so long. Most people have no freaking idea. The average person has no idea. So we're so early still. We're still in the like early, early, early adoption phase of this technology. No more than 2 to 3% of the world. So, um, I mean, that's crazy because a lot of people are like, oh, this thing's done with and over and no, 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 no. Like we, we haven't even begun. We haven't even begun to get started yet. So it's very exciting to think about what, what what's to come. Yeah, it's it's sort of funny you say that we, uh, you know, our our company obviously it's Bitcoin education, you know, and how do you trojan yeah. horse people with Bitcoin education? And you know, we did we've done card shows, and people come up to us like they think we're the CEO of Bitcoin. I mean, to your point of how early we are, I yeah, mean, I mean, like we're so early. early. No, I was on the phone with like a journalist from a major, major, major news organization the other day. They did a profile, and like uh, uh, and all the political sort of political figures speaking in Nashville, and they were quoting me in that. They had no idea the difference between Bitcoin and crypto. I think most crypto people don't know the difference between Bitcoin and people and crypto. I think a lot of Bitcoin users don't even, uh, you know, and those are people who are like, have spent some time looking at it. The average Joe, I mean, Bitcoin, Dogecoin, they don't, they don't know the difference. There's no, Litecoin, they have no idea. So, so we're, even if you've heard of it, you don't know. Like, and it could take, it's it's very it, in ten years it'll be different because the education keeps improving, but like like the education today and the access to tools and education is is, is way more diverse than it used to be. But still, we are light years from where we're going to be in the future. So true. I, I think of myself. I graduated in Michigan State, playing playing hockey, played in the minors for a few years. So like oh nine, two thousand ten, around those time periods, and I I studied I've been studying for fifteen years, and it took me you know, just in the last seven years to finally find Bitcoin or eight, whatever it was, seven, eight years ago. And then it took me two or three years. And I was already studying this stuff all the time. So I, you know, you think of the average person and how, do, like you said, we're, we're so far um, away, but at the same time, it only takes a few percent of people, right? The small and transigent minority to make it a thing. Not everyone's going to know about it necessarily. And I think, like you said, that's the nuance that Bitcoiners sh probably should understand where it's not, everyone's going to know what Bitcoin is through and through. It's just the whole world population is not going to know that, nor they need to know that. So I think that's you know important. In in saying that, do you think coming to the politics here in America, um, the right and the left? You're right, again, this is something you see yeah. a lot a, a lot of um, in your work. What do you think are some of the the uh, the similarities between the two sides? Like, where do you think the right and the left can come together? Uh, whether it's Bitcoin or maybe you know it's Bitcoin bringing things together, uh, a neutral money, you know. Where do you where do you see that kind of falling? Where are those similarities? Because there is a Venn diagram, or it's a circle in a way, right? Like it's at some point that you kind of come back together, and you're more similar than you are different. So, look, um, a lot of the early cypherpunks were libertarians, and I thought it made sense that libertarians would be some of the earliest users of Bitcoin. Now. That's not necessarily the case. You know, establishment libertarians, a lot of them still hate on Bitcoin. So it's not even like a, a done deal, which is crazy to me. I'm like, are you serious? You, you, you know, but some of them are into it. Some of them are not. There's a famous libertarian event that happens up in New Hampshire where apparently people are totally out on Bitcoin now. They're into all sorts of shit coins, whatever. Like the, it's a bizarre, it's a bizarre thing. So, you know, nothing's guaranteed, but it was, it made more sense, I think, at the beginning for like more libertarian type folks, like Ron Paul type folks to sort of grasp it. Um, but as Bitcoin has grown, it, it, it's kind of like a mirror. It's like whatever you want to see, it, it is, right? It can do almost anything. So I think that, you know, it was sort of predictable that maybe the Republican Party would get lean into it a little more, uh, especially around mining. I think if there was less disinformation about mining, it would be completely bipartisan. I think the problem is that um, there's so much disinformation and fake news about Bitcoin mining and how it works and what it does that people who are more sort of pro-environmental regulation, which is the Democrat party, um, are just, just reactive, just sort of allergically allergic reaction to Bitcoin. They don't know what it is. They just, they know it's bad for the environment. So 
of course we can't have that on our platform. I think that that's one of the biggest re reasons is all this disinformation and fake news about Bitcoin mining, which is why I dedicated a third of my talk to that and show people that this is a green thing that is saving energy and promoting green energy. Um, but until people understand the truth, like they're just going to be out in the woods, like this is what it is. So we have the Republican Party more into it, but there's plenty of Democrats who are into it. And we'll see. I mean, eventually everybody's going to be into it, but it's just a matter of time. I also would be a little careful about like putting all your eggs in like the Trump basket or whatever. Like I get it. He's saying some nice things, but it was pretty obvious to anybody listening to that speech. He had no freaking idea what he was saying. Um, you know, he was one was this, he was, he was like stable coins. What's that? Like he, he was just reading a speech someone wrote for him. And, you know, one of the last things he did when he was in power was try to go after self custody with Steve Nuchin, like, you know, midnight, like right before he got left office. So we don't really know. Um, remember Trump's a very national security type guy, like, you know, uh, law and order, like, we don't know, uh, you know, uh, we don't know who's, we honestly don't know who's going to be better for Bitcoin. And honestly, Bitcoin doesn't care. Like, we should just keep working on what we're working on. And DC is going to DC, like it is what it is. There's a reason I'm not based there. Um, Bitcoin has its own incentives that pull people into it, okay, regardless of what we do. Um, you know, these the president of the United States or the former president or the future president, they, they were always going to get into Bitcoin because it's becoming a bigger global thing. I mean, it's, it's becoming an increasingly large currency in the world. So it's going to demand people's attention in every country. And it indeed has the CCP, the U.S. government, every large government, the Indian government. They've already been tumbling and, you know, grappling with it for five plus years through different legislation, different things. I, I do think that the incentives behind Bitcoin are, you know, to my, my little Trojan horse here, um, that they're pretty amazing. I mean, like strategic Bitcoin reserve, what? This is wild. I mean, we have like all these congressmen and senators and governors and Trump talking about a strategic Bitcoin reserve, like, dude, 10 years ago, you know, people would have been like, you're smoking crack. But yeah, I mean, like, and they're going to do it to themselves. Like they, they have this fiat bubble and they're going to pop it. Like They're, they're going to help pop it. They don't know what they're, they're out there saying. Oh, it's going to be great for the dollar. No, it's not. It's going to be great for America and Americans. It's going to be great for. It's not going to be good for the dollar and the dollar industrial complex. It's going to kill the dollar industrial complex. So I'm glad that they think it's going to help the dollar. No, it's not going to help the dollar. Um, it's going to help kill the dollar and replace it with something way better for humans and for the world which is one open neutral monetary standard that's very democratic, progressive, and open to everybody. So I'm pumped for it, but it's it's the Trojan horse thing, man. I mean, they don't know what the, bringing this thing into the city walls, like they think it's going to be great for the dollar. I have news for them. It's not going to be great for the dollar. So, um, you know, it is what it is. It's amazing. Really amazing. I know you've got a handful of minutes here. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the, the one thing that I again, the mining, people have to go watch your speech because you do such an unbelievable job laying out the mining. And that, that to me is going to be the game changer. Like that's the humanity changer. And you do a great job of explaining a lot of that. So again, people link it, people got to go watch that. The dollar, you talked about also, I don't know if it was during the speeches or if it was on the news desk after or in between there, but you were talking about the reserve currency. You just kind of touched on Americans and how Bitcoin is not good for the dollar. It's great for humanity. It's great for Americans, it's great for all people. I would love for you to kind of touch on just really quick, the the reserve currency and how it actually like a lot of americans are patriotic about like oh this is so great but it actually keeps them backward i'd love for you just to kind of touch on that for 30 seconds is why it's not exactly what you think it is that the dollar being the res like a good thing a reserve currency for americans well it gives the elites of the united states and wall street privileges they can create money out of thin air and use it to buy valuable things like oil and real estate and it's given us an incredible ability to weaponize the currency system around the world and, and cut off people we don't like. But it has, A, been net negative for the average American in terms of it has um, made making things in the United States very uncompetitive. And we have this enormous Rust Belt type phenomena that has emerged out of the deindustrialization of America, where we don't really make things as much anymore as we used to. Um, and that's because our labor rates are really high because our currency is very strong. It's artificially strong because of this phenomenon where everybody needs dollars. They're all demanding dollars. If we had an open neutral currency, then we wouldn't have this issue and we wouldn't have this sort of deindustrialization effect. Um, so, you know, it might be, it'll be worse for the 1% 
in some ways in terms of their ability to have political corruption globally. But I think it'll be better for the average American and it'll be way, way better for people like all, all the other people in the world, essentially, outside of a handful of elites in, in America and Europe, like for the average person in the world to be able to control their own savings and interact in a one global monetary language is going to be a massive freaking upgrade. So there are a small pe- group of people that control the world where it's going to harm them and change them and force them to change. Uh, but the overwhelming majority of humanity, this is going to be a great transition for them. It's incredible. I know we've got two minutes here, two, two last quick ones. What was your orange pill story? What, what was your you know, one minute version of, uh, of getting to Bitcoin, finding Bitcoin? Yeah, well, I, it took a long time. I, I learned about it initially a long time ago uh, when, when WikiLeaks posted the Bitcoin address. And I just for years, I kept popping up. People kept yelling at me about it, you know, as Bitcoiners are. They were always like that, right? And uh, I just was not interested. And finally, like t- 2013, 14, 15, 16, people would come take me out to lunch and try to pitch me on it. Like I just was just not, I just couldn't get through. I I mean, I I thought it was interesting, but I just, I just didn't get it. And then finally, um, some sort of mix of things, but really like, uh, you know, I, I started to look at Andreas Antonopoulos' stuff and I think he's the really person who helped me see it the way I see it today. Um, and then, and then watching everything in 2017 go down with the block size war was really interesting for me. And when I saw that happen and I saw, you know, by the end of the year that, that the, uh, big blockers had lost, that was interesting to me because I was like, wait a second, these guys had, you know, all the hash rate, they had, you know, China, China, China power, they had Silicon Valley and, and they lost to the sovereign individual. That was really interesting. So that, that, that was what hooked me. So by, 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 by the end of 2017, I was, I was very, very in, um, it, it continued to take me a little time to figure everything out. Probably by summer 2018, I, I was really where I needed to be, you know, in terms of understanding Bitcoin versus all the other crypto stuff, but it, it was a journey. It definitely took me many years to get to the very simple understanding that Bitcoin is this powerful tool for human rights. Yeah. So cool. All right. Last one really quick. Why did you say yes to being in Bitcoin trading cards? <laughs> oh, well, I love trading cards. When I was a kid, I uh, loved Magic the Gathering. Um, I played all the time starting in like fourth grade. So starting in the early to mid nineties, I was really into magic and um, not really sports cards, mainly just magic, but I was mm-hmm. super into magic until, I don't know, probably eighth or ninth grade. Um, and uh, regrettably, I sold my magic collection uh, when I went to college, uh, as many other people did, for uh, not that many fiat dollars. And I, uh, I should have held on to the cards. I had some good ones. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, but that's, 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 I just like trading cards are fun. Oh, I also like Pokemon cards. Those are fun too. So, um, uh, yeah, someone was going to make Bitcoin trading cards. I was like, this is great. All about it. Love it. Absolutely love it. Well, thank you so much. Where can people find you, Alex? Uh, well, you can find me, uh, on Noster, um, which is where I would encourage people to take a look these days. Uh, Gladstein at primal.net. Um, you can also find my NPUB in my Twitter profile. So Twitter, I'm on, I'm at Gladstein. Uh, so if you look at my profile, you'll see my NPUB. And um, yeah, find me on X up, up there on, on, on X Twitter, whatever you want to call it. Find me on Noster. Uh, that's where I'm posting these days. See you around. Okay. Thank Beautiful. You. Thank you, Alex, for being a yep. playable character right. in a sea of non playable characters. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, appreciate it. Take care. Thank you for checking out this episode of the Playable Characters Show, brought to you by Bitcoin Trading Cards. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of the future Bitcoin and financial experts we have on the show. Plus, we will be doing random big giveaways throughout different moments of shows of collectible cards, sats, merch, and more from guests, so you won't not miss anything. This show does not constitute any investment advice, only freedom advice. Everything you see here is opinions from the host and the guests themselves, nothing further. Please don't trust, verify. For full transparency, I do lead marketing efforts at Bitcoin Trading Cards where we are trying to spread freedom to all of humanity and orange pill the world one collectible physical trading card at a time 
by making things fun and easy to talk about that normally make you want to cry. You can reach me directly through my email, brandon at btc-cards.com with any inquiries or playable character suggestions. See you on the next one.